ESPN celebrating 150 years of college football. You learn so much about having the desire to succeed in football, which carries over into the game of life. To be a great football player, you've got to have the physical qualifications. Speed, strength, endurance. It's uniquely American, this game. It has the competition, it has the spirit, it has the passion, plus... Color, pageantry, tradition. These are the ingredients that make college football unique. In a football game, somebody's going to be a winner. Somebody's going to be a loser. Obviously, if we beat you, we're smarter and we're better looking. It's more in the game. You can't get no better than this. The power of the passion for the sport in all the ways that that's on display, whether it's the bands, the songs, the cheerleaders, the stadiums, all the things that come together to create college football culture. Presented by Cintas. As a kid, uh, Saturday afternoon, having a chance to put on a uniform, and maybe it would even rain outside, and you get a chance to go out in the mud and pretend to be like some of those people you saw on television. You know, having a football in my hands, that was that was something I was wanting to do. Mark Harmon, the quarterback. He gives the ball, nope, keeps it, throws it, compacts, just complete. I seriously knew that I was a Seminole before I knew that I was female or that we were white. You know, the Seminole thing came first. You go into the game and look, when you're five or six, you don't know what the hell's going on, you don't know what downs are and so on, but you know what the band is when they come out, you know what the banner is and they run out and touch it. You absorb the culture first. The game comes second. When you go to a place like Michigan, or you go to a place like Florida State, or you go to a place like Ohio State, or Alabama, or Notre Dame, or UCLA, or SC, those are cultural choices. Those choices are bigger than you. If you leave your alma mater, and you go to Portland, or San Diego, or it makes no difference. Your, your ties get stronger. This never leaves you. It is an organic experience, and the loyalty never dies. It's whatever you grew up with, that's who you are. We did not call college football college football for the first 50 years. There was no other football. It's football, and it is created by college students for college students. The only game you can say that grew that way. 1787, Thomas Jefferson writes the Northwest Ordinance, and with that, all of a sudden, you have state universities. Now you've got hundreds and then thousands of single men and women all in one place with no adult supervision. What could possibly go wrong? And of course, it goes wrong immediately in the form of heavy drinking uh, and violence in the form of football. In the very first game, 1869, uh, between Rutgers and Princeton. And it was two teams, 25 men each. And it was a game where no one got to run with the ball. It was strictly a kicking game. And you might be able to, you could bat it with your head like they do in soccer, you could, or you could even punch the ball. And the first team to get six goals was the winner. All the schools that played football got together and formed this codified set of rules. One of the people who wasn't involved was Harvard, because they played a game where you actually could run with the ball. And so Harvard then played a, some, a series of games against McGill University out of Montreal, Canada, and they played this rugby type of a game, which they liked much better than the game where you couldn't run with the ball. And so finally, in 1876, the leaders of the major universities, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Columbia, got together to form the first football association and agree on a common set of rules. Because uh, up till that point, every time you had a game, you had to spend an hour before the game just agreeing on what rules you're going to play by. And then by the early 1880s, it had evolved to what we know as American football. The most tragic of all wars, 
that of brother against brother was forced upon the nation. I think it's significant that the game is considered to have started right after the Civil War. You know, there was much more of an urban existence, on, certainly on the East Coast, than there had been. You know, that sort of rough pioneer life was a previous generation. So there was concern that young men were getting soft. College football, it arrives primarily because there's concern about the end of masculinity in the Victorian era and in these elite universities like Harvard. Our culture was about physicality, it was about toughness, it was about beating other people, it was about gaining the edge. And I think the game came along at a time where it really captured the needs of the culture and what the culture was all about. And so I think that's the reason why the sport initially gained a foothold the way that it did. The game was really pretty much an Eastern game. It then spread to what they would call, at that time, the West, you know, Michigan. It starts in 1869, of course. Just 10 years later, a band of Michigan students decide to take the train to Chicago to play a school called Racine College. If you want your school to be big, you have to jump on the sensation sweep in the nation, college football. The game has now crossed the Alleghenies. It is spreading fast. And it gets out to the West Coast just 10 years after that. So now this thing is now a national game. It catches fire. The president of Cornell University, President White, he said memorably, I will not permit 30 men to travel 200 miles to agitate a pig's bladder full of wind. <laughs> they don't talk like this anymore. The faculty hated it. The presidents hated it. The students loved it. The alumni loved it, the new sports press loved it, and now the fans also start coming. So I think it becomes a source of pride in a lot of communities, especially in the South. What's incredible about the growth of college football is that this is before the internet, this is before telephones. The only way you can explain this is the unbelievable passion of these college students to hop on a train to play a game. And that shows you what drove this thing. It's the intense passion that drives it today. Fires to the end zone, touchdown! Alabama wins! for class reunions, year after year. What is it that keeps this loyalty alive? It's not just for good fellowship that they return, nor for the architectural beauty of its buildings. Stone itself can come to life when it is a symbol of the things live men have done or hope to do. There is a sense of pride that comes with representing your school and wearing those colors. And when you go to a football game, it's supposed to be an experience. Every time I see blue and gold, I think about Pittsburgh. Purple and gold? It's the color of love. I can't stand the burnt orange. Well, you know, that cardinal and gold, that just looks good. If you've gone to a game, you get it. It also has the kind of quality of a a fraternity or a sorority somehow. There's like a kind of like, we're together in this, we are a unique group. I think that's why people enjoy it so much. It's ingrained in them. It's as much a part of their lives as their last name. Schools had colors uh, early on. If you look at the old prints from the late 19th century, the young women who came to the games wore chrysanthemums in the color of their schools. But the colors were not conspicuous on the uniforms. The uniforms were pretty uniform. Light and dark uniforms, you know, became required when newsreels started covering these games, and you couldn't tell the two teams apart unless there was some kind of difference. But the colors, you know, were adopted basically from the beginning. The school colors were part of, of the early pageantry of football. Colors are important because it's just a way to identify, you know, those are my peeps, those are my people. You know, you may not think you look good in purple, 
but you're going to wear it and you're going to love wearing it because that's how you identify with your school. You've got to be known for something and you got to be the cool place to be. So when we got to Texas, my wife Sally and I got together and said, nobody's wearing burnt orange. And I love burnt orange. There's history and there's stories. And so we said, come early, stay late, wear burnt orange. That was really important to us. I'd have ladies come up and say, I don't look good in burnt orange. I said, you will for four and a half hours. Just wear it for me. What about these Longhorn fans? They're unbelievable. And now the stands are full. It's your identity. It's your religion. It's how you view yourself. It connects to our core, that visceral reaction, that need to be part of something, a tribe. You can't help but want to be a part of it. And for those who have been a part of it, who went to State U, or when, who went to Hale Alma Mater, or the place that you still hold dear to your heart, it never really leaves you. You could get some perfect stranger hugging on you and telling you, I love you, man, because you're wearing the right colors, whatever the right colors are that day. We are who we are because we are not those guys, those other people, those bad people who live somewhere else, maybe as much as half an hour away. You begin to understand the team colors in the culture of the sport, even away from football season. When you travel and you see that people choose to pack their Tennessee t-shirts to go around the world because they want to be associated with the Tennessee Volunteers or Michigan Wolverines, and the fans will wear their team colors 365 wherever they are in the world, and it's a conversation starter. If I see a guy wearing an Ohio State t-shirt and I'm in Asia, all I have to say is, OH, he'll turn around. Ice has been broken. It's funny, I, I just saw a guy at the airport, and the guy says, go Irish. And I write back, go Irish. And it's just that energy that, because I, I get it. This year, with touchdowns as valuable to player as to college, the U.S. public is more certain than ever of getting its gridiron dollars worth from the game, which commercialized or amateur remains unchallenged as the nation's most colorful, most exciting sports spectacle. We're the only country in the world that has turned collegiate sports, university-level amateur sports, into, last I looked, $3.8 billion a year industry. There is Coach Bill Battle, born in Birmingham, played for Bear Bryant, 60, 61, 62, a member of the all-60s team that Alabama folks, and there he is in the hound's tooth hat, Mr. Paul Bear Bryant. Bill Battle is a genius. He gets fired at Tennessee only because he couldn't beat Bear Bryant in Alabama. He had played for Bryant at Alabama. So Bryant called him and said, you know, Bill, I don't have time to deal with all these endorsements and people calling me. You know, to help them with their business, can you handle it for me? So Bill started doing that. And then out of that, he began to see the math and the, the amount of money that was involved and the fact that the Crimson A could be trademarked. Souvenir! I got, I got almost everything! Oh, yeah! Did he think it would become a billion dollar business? I'm guessing not, but it just never stopped. It's always often interesting to watch when alumni come across the campus. It looks like they're reliving their past. And collegiate licensing is now the life of a lot of athletic programs. We just opened up my storage unit. It's so old, and it was all my Gator stuff. And my husband, who's, you know, Canadian, played in the NHL, has no concept of the SEC. He's pulling out, what are these? Those are my pom-poms. What is this? It's a replica of the, you know, trophy we won for the national championship. Why do you have it? I don't know. My whole room used to be decorated in orange and blue. 
If I have the Sports Illustrated commemorative, you know, book after Danny Warfel won it in 96, it's just like, God, I have a lot of crap, but this crap is so memorable and it means something to me. At pullback from Santa Barbara, number 39, Sam Cunningham. At SC, we don't have names on the jerseys and we don't wear white shoes. And I had a coach tell me, he says, well, we only have numbers on the jersey so your mama can know who you are. <laughs> but that's it, because if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have that. When people do certain little minute changes of uniform, people get upset because that's not who we are. I'm more of a traditional guy. You know, I, I, I grew up, I grew up seeing SC wear a certain uniform, or I saw Michigan wearing a certain uniform. You know, that winged helmet looks like nothing else in college football that I can recall. But there are kids out there now who want to wear 30 different uniforms a year. I think the most unique story of that is Oregon, because Oregon was a nobody in the mid-1990s. They just lost to Colorado in a bowl game. And that'll do it. The Buffaloes of Colorado are the 1996 winners of the Cotton Bowl Classic with a convincing victory over the Ducks of Oregon. They had what they thought was going to be an after party at a hotel turned into a wake. And you have Phil Knight from Nike, you have Mike Bellotti, who was the head coach at the time, gathered together, drinking cocktails. What can we do? Let's go all out and try to brand Oregon. And they were the first program to think about college football being a brand. The OG of sick uniforms in college football, Oregon. Oregon's a fascinating story because what they did was they said, you know what our tradition is that we have no tradition. You're 17, what do you want? Now, why'd they do that? They did it out of necessity because they're stuck in the woods up in Oregon and they're not really growing linebackers there. Anybody in college football who's building the program, they go to Oregon to see what they're doing and see what they've done to try to emulate what they uh, have accomplished because it's, it's still, you know, at the cutting edge of college football. It's easy to pick out who's on my team and who isn't on my team. I think it's part of the appeal of college football and college sports in general. Hey, it's great. That's what I go to school for, football. It gives us another arena in which to connect with people, identify with a place, define ourselves. And that definition stays with us for the rest of our life. In my house growing up, if an orange cushion got near a blue cushion, my father would throw one of them across the room because you don't put orange and blue together. That's a gator thing. You know, we were Florida State people. It's like, where am I? You're just in this other land, and it's almost like Wizard of Oz. Different planet, different world, different country, and you are in the world of this team and everybody wearing these colors. You just become absolutely submerged in this school passion and this school pride. They just scored a touchdown and the tradition is after a touchdown, they crowd surf. I'll see you later. It's so hard not to get caught up into it, but you have to love it. You have to go to these towns and you have to live and breathe their school spirit and their pride and their passion. And you're just like, all right, go dogs, go Gators, go Vols. Go Dogs! Go dogs! marching band, and pretty girl. No wonder football is so popular. The bands mean to college football what military bands used to mean to war. If you think about football, it's about territory. I'm going to score a goal by taking your territory. I'm going to try to stop you from taking my territory. It's the most elemental aspect of war. In olden times, the bands were there to help you march in the right rhythm so that you could go into battle in an efficient way. They did not have majorettes. I'm the one that always would stick around for halftime because I want to see it. 
You know, the USC band, one of my favorites, is this. Like, I love it now. Texas band, it was the big drum. I mean, it's the best. The Alabama's band, when they just come all out and they're all their red. The Tennessee band, it's just... Marching bands matter so much because they're the identity of the school, of the culture. When we talk about culture, marching band is very much a part of the fabric that comprises college football. When you are a member of the marching band, that says, I'm part of game day too. Band members take a lot of pride in that. You can hear the pounding of the drum. You can hear the kids and their horns and going back and forth. I love, you know, the cheerleaders. I love the dancers. It's just another layer of the passion. When bands come out in college football, that sets the tone for the atmosphere and the environment that they're in. And it's just the bands carry that much weight. Uh, my friend Michael Weinrib insists that if a school has a good band and is playing at home, it's worth two and a half points. I said three. Marching bands are like the soul of the team. Marching bands are, are for certain teams and certain conferences. It, for some fans, they're as big as the team. Ladies and gentlemen, the pride of the Buckeyes, the Ohio State University Marching Band. And in Ohio State's case, the marching band, I mean, you, you could probably put Woody Hayes up there, marching band would be right there, Archie Griffin's right there. I mean, it's, it's, it's really high. The team respects the band because they work just as hard as the team does. They try out for the 200 and whatever spots on the band. And of course, the, with the script Ohio and the dotting of the I, that's tradition. history of the Ohio State Marching Band is they will have a guest come in to dot the I. It's quite an emotional, especially for the people that have ties to Ohio State, it's an emotional honor to dot the I. Time-honored traditions, one of the great ones in college football, Script Ohio and Jack Nicholas. A guy like Jack Nicholas who's done everything that we all look at as an outside. Look, look at his accomplishments in life. Here he is just being walked out to dot the I. Extremely heartfelt, compelling moment. Golden Bear uh, welling up in tears. Uh. For him to be moved to tears tells you a lot about he's probably seeing his whole life flash through his eyes. All right, here we go with the kickoff. Armand will probably try to squib it, and he does. Ball comes loose, and the Bears have to get out of bounds along the sideline, another one. They're still in deep trouble at midfield. They tried to do a couple of... The ball is still loose as they get it to Rogers. They give it back now to the 30. They're down to the 20. All oh, the band is out on the field. He's going to go into the end zone. He's going to the end zone. The most amazing, sensational, dramatic, heart-rending, exciting, thrilling finish in the history of college football, California. Knowing the history of Stanford Band, if you did, you'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. The Stanford Band was one of the first to reject the martial effects of a marching band, the, you know, the almost militaristic look and feel of marching in a straight line. You know, it's really hard to find the words to describe the Leland Stanford Marching Band, and I think they like it that way. They've been banned on national television before for offensive behavior. They do anything crazy that they can. I think to a certain degree, the Stanford Band embraces that part of the country, a reverent, progressive. They're going to do what they want. They're going to be who they are. And all of those qualities are embodied in Stanford's Marching Band. And they are just the height of smart-ass irreverence. I think they just get upset because it's not what they expect from a band. What's the essence of humor than, than surprising people, you know, and, and shocking people?
my experiences around football, especially historically black colleges and universities, allowed me to just take in more than a football game because it's so much more than that. It's usually the band, the sororities, the fraternities, styling and profiling. Everything is bigger and better in the South. We're more expressive. And every year at Thanksgiving, you know what we did? We all got dressed up. We bought new clothes like we were going to church. We drove from Baton Rouge to New Orleans, and we went to the Bayou Classic. The Bayou Classic is like the granddaddy of them all. It was also the first HBCU football game that we saw regularly on television. The Bayou Classic is the Sugar Bowl for black universities. A lot of people look forward to the game, don't get me wrong, but a lot of people look forward to the Battle of the Bands. Southern may go to that line and do a, to the rear and come back. Graham gonna go to that line and do a slide into the rear. That's Graham. This was competition. The dancing dolls for the Southern University Band would get out there and they'd shake their thing and Southern's band would play and then Grambling's band would play and it was called the Battle of the Bands. That was on Friday night and the game was on Saturday night. And then Sunday you slept it all off and everybody partied and they recovered. It was real. If you look at a lot of Big Ten bands, they pull a lot of that showmanship from Florida A&M's Marching 100. This is a tribute really to black music. It's been mentioned several times that you cannot go anywhere in the world to uh, any discotheque or to listen to a symphony orchestra concert that hasn't had its uh, influence as a result of black music. So the sound is terrific, but it's also the showmanship that goes along with it. It's truly a vibration, and I think that just the nature of fun and celebration and happiness and expression comes out through music. We thank you. Fight songs, if they're any good at all, you know, become really powerful for those that they touch, you know, the, the students at the university and then the players that play there. What it means to me even now as I'm in my 40s, well, you're talking to a former dancer at the University of Florida. In fact, not only is Erin Anderson alone, oh, she was a dazzler was a back dazzler. in the day. She's I drop whatever I'm doing and I do the fight song. I mean, full on, know it by heart, get goosebumps even now. How many things haven't changed in a century? Your fight song hasn't changed. 1898, third year of the Big Ten. Amos Lonzo Stagg's got another great Chicago team. Michigan travels there. It's for the Big Ten title. Whoever wins, wins. Michigan is losing late in the game. An unknown player comes on there and rattles off two big runs. They win. They rush the field. A guy named Louis Elbel, a Michigan musical student. Uh, is so inspired by this. By the time he walks to his brother's house in Chicago, he's got the victors in his head all figured out, and he writes it all down. And I've studied the various fight songs. Big Ten's got a lot of great ones. The Service Academies, the Ivies. Now, the men of the Scarlet and Gray, Ohio State, they say what? They say, men of the Scarlet and Gray, you have to win this game today. The victor says what? It's the only song I know of where the game's already over. They've won. They've won the, the league, the universe, whatever else. We're hopping on the bus. We're going home. All right? Everyone else calls it arrogance. Michigan fans call it confidence. But that's how much these things are pinned to your culture. Dude, it's, it's, uh, there's nothing like it, man. Just the, the choreography of it all. Hail to the conquering heroes. Hail, hail. To Michigan, the champions of the West. Go blue! Come on, man. Awesome. You felt that, didn't you?
those coveted Army Notre Dame ducats are the password today, and football fans are on edge everywhere. The West Point cadets are out in full force to cheer their team on in an effort to hang up the nation's gridiron title. The tough Irish Terriers are loaded for mule today, and the big crowd gets set for a game they'll never forget. Lena, the hyena, looks ferocious, but not as ferocious as some of the... Mascots are like a gateway drug to college football. That's how kids get involved. That's how the casual fan understands who that team is. mascot is a symbol for so many people of hope, of tradition, of pride. I think that's a big reason why they're treated the way they are. The college mascots, again, were all come by organically, voted on by the students. There's not a focus group, it just happened organically. One great example, the Notre Dame team was known as the Vagabonds originally, but they changed that because they felt that was derogatory as a stereotype towards Irish Americans. So what do you change it to? The fighting Irish, a little leprechaun with his chops up. <laughs> I don't know if that solved the problem. Where the fighting Irish nickname comes from is from the, the media of that time and the players fighting and scrapping in games. Time and again he's hit before he goes down under a magnificent flying tackle. And that's how the, the evolution of that, that name and that notoriety started there. And of course, you know, the leprechaun as a mascot for Notre Dame can be somewhat problematic if we look back in history of how the Irish were viewed as immigrants in the Thomas Nast cartoons. It's not a positive thing. I think Notre Dame has been able to flip the script on that and make it a positive thing and something that the Irish are proud of, but it certainly didn't start that way. The first big mascot that I can think of is Yale's Handsome Dan, which one of the players was going on the class one day, and I believe he passed a fire station and they had some mongrel dog that was hanging around there, and so he adopted this dog, and it, was, it wasn't a very attractive dog, so he called him Handsome Dan, and that became the Yale mascot. The favorite bulldog gets the jump on its traditional foe in this Ivy League classic. With the schools in the East, you know, the Harvard, Yale, Princeton, you know, these are the, the big three. These are the people that established the game, and so other people are learning from them. And so if, if Yale is called the Bulldogs, obviously you're going to have a lot of other schools that are going to emulate Yale and calling themselves the Bulldogs or the Princeton Tigers and what have you. And, but a lot of the other mascots are, are sort of involved with the, the area of the country that you're from. There are two kinds of mascots. There's the guy in the suit. There was the costume tiger. He actually is the mascot for the LSU band. But the great mascots are the ones that are actually alive. Listen, Georgia football is reign supreme there. All the great players, the great games over the years. But I think UGA is, to me, almost bigger than the game, almost bigger than the dog's football program. It's because of how iconic he is. I love to walk before the game, go down early, and sort of, sort of watching him hanging out there. Got his own house there on the sidelines in Sanford Stadium. All the people coming by just sort of gasping and looking at him. We've got all the different Uggas who are no longer with us, all their grave sites there. Again, when you start talking about what separates college football, it's mascots like Ugga. Ladies and gentlemen, this is like a man walking on the moon. Never before. Oh, 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 oh my lord! When we're talking about mascots, you want to be unique. You want to be different. You want to be special. Got to the 20. The 5. End zone. Touchdown. Bevo says, hey, easy there, big fella. I'm on your side. Knowing the history of that mascot, just to see him walk across the field as a team, we knew we had a shot when we know Bevo's in the house. Nobody's got Bevo. And at the University of Texas, that is Bevo. Hook him, hook him, hook him, hook him, hook him, baby, hook him, baby. Oh! He's the largest live mascot 
and college football, which goes right along with the way Texans like things bigger is better. Actually, one of the, the very first Bevo, uh, the, uh, the Texas officials got tired of paying for his feed every day, so they decided uh, we're just going to send him to the slaughterhouse and feed him to the football team at the end of your banquet. So the first Bevo suffered kind of a, uh, an unfortunate fate. Are you ready for a workout? Run with Ralphie. The University of Colorado, they love their Buffaloes, and none more than Ralphie, who thunders out onto the field in front of the football team on game days. It's so cool. Look at those guys saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Majestic, though. I think that getting exposed to a program that did have a tradition and had a lot of color and pageantry around it and watching Ralphie sort of charge out of her pen, Ralphie is female, charge out of her pen and run around the field. It's one of the coolest traditions to get a game started in college football. Ralphie on the move. That Buffalo run out is one of the coolest things. I mean, that's ridiculous, actually. A, a Buffalo. I don't even, you know, now that you mention it, other than Ralphie, I don't know that I've ever actually seen a Buffalo. I am a fan of any mascot that, in a different circumstance, could kill me. <laughs> Of course we have a live tiger, we're LSU. We would go visit Mike the Tiger all the time, say hello, make sure he wasn't lonely. What, are you kidding me? I love Mike the Tiger. Yeah, he probably wouldn't attack us, but we just, we simply can't take that risk. He's not a pet, he's a wild animal, and we treat, we treat him as such. To ha actually have an animal, take care of the animal, and bring it out and present it in front of people, in front of tens of thousands of people, and keep it under control. I think that's like more impressive than a dude, you know, like Pistol Pete at Oklahoma State. You know, my dad said when, when he played at Michigan that they actually had a real Wolverine in, in a cage, in a tunnel. He said half the players wouldn't go buy it. He said they were scared to death. He said the meanest animal he'd ever seen. And so now they, they got rid of that, and that's so big because it was scaring the players. No, bad dog, outside. We've been through this. Those folks who dress up in the heads and the mascot thing, that's a hard, hot, uncomfortable job. And there's no off time, but you have to stay in character. There are lots and lots of eccentric mascots. I mean, you know, a buckeye. I didn't know what a Buckeye was till somebody from Ohio gave me one, and I went, it's a nut, isn't it? The mascots express who you think you are and what you think you are. Gators are gators, Seminoles are Seminoles, Bulldogs are Bulldogs. Thousands of people just inhabit this identity, and it is completely tribal. We have a need to identify with a group. And a mascot is a very clear symbol. It just allows us to go all in with that. In autumn's golden sparkle, King Football draws Ohio's teeming thousands to the playing fields of colorful Columbus. The year does not start on January 1st. It's not, you know, spring bloom. It's fall, man. Uh, the students are on campus. The leaves are starting to change. It's gorgeous. College football is famously referred to as the front porch of the university. It's the way that a lot of people enter the school, and, and it's the way they come back to the school emotionally. What fans love is that experience, that experience they have in coming back every Saturday, that they're going to have that tailgate to go to, that they're going to reunite with those friends that they can talk to about this game. We're good-natured people. All we want to do is tailgate. <laughs> <laughs> When I close my eyes and I think about college football, I smell what's happening in the parking lot. I smell the smoked meats. I smell the drinks. Get your wine, get your beer, get ready to go. Set your table up and tailgate. 
for hours. Some of these people drove almost a thousand miles to drink their pre-game champagne and Bloody Marys. I mean, you would think it's the county fair. I mean, smoke's in the air, flags are flying, people are going crazy, and it's every Saturday. Tailgating, you know, myth or legend-wise, you know, there, there are reports that tailgating was there at the very beginning. The very earliest games were not played in stadiums. They were played in fields. Spectators would actually pull up in their carriages and watch the game from their carriages. You can't charge admission that way. You know, as soon as somebody figured out that, oh, if you play in an enclosed stadium, you can get some money from people to come in and watch the game, then, th then that disappeared. I think tailgating is a modern phenomenon. Michigan's athletic director in 68 is a guy named Don Canham. And he's the guy who figured out that if you're going to market this game and spread it, you get the dads already. You need the moms. And if the mom just determines what's going to happen that weekend with the kids and all that, you got to pitch more than just wins and losses. You can't guarantee this. So he pitched the experience of the whole thing. We found that as soon as you had a sellout, the ticket demand increased tremendously. So we wanted to create the impression that we had a sellout. So we had dollar high school tickets, and then we'd invite 35 bands. Sell the experience, don't sell the game. The fall colors, the marching band, uh, the camaraderie you feel uh, in the big house. You can actually count on this experience in a way you can't count on much else. 105,000 people gathered to watch Michigan play football. It shows you Canham's genius of selling the experience, not just the game. Welcome to the Grove, 10 sacred acres of the collegiate landscape. At Ole Miss, they're not just having food out. There are these beautiful, elaborate tents like you would see at a wedding. They're very much into the tradition of what I would call like white Southern aristocracy. It's the damnedest thing I've ever seen. I did not respect or appreciate it uh, before I got there. I was awed by its power. I have no idea why people at a public university in Mississippi are running around in bow ties, you know, drinking champagne before a football game when the rest of America has a keg of beer and a jersey on. That's an all-week preparation. <laughs> I don't understand it, but it's what that fan base loves, um, often more than the game itself. It's nice to see that college football fans are still able to be as regionalized and as different from one part of the country to the other as they are. Tailgating is a, is a perfect example of that. It becomes the whole scene the whole day. Mama! And I think sampling different tailgates throughout the, the country, it reflects just how different each of those college campuses are and their traditions. I can tell you the tailgates at Miami are far different than the tailgates in Tallahassee. When we're just talking about food, Miami serves uh, Hispanic food. There's Cuban dishes. There's a lot more partying going on, much more of a fiesta-like atmosphere. Eugene, Oregon, Clemson, South Carolina, Auburn, Alabama. It, it's like people are being pulled and drawn by this force that stirs something deep within them and it is like it awakens and all pointing toward this three and a half hour extravaganza. It's like a pilgrimage or a voyage that people feel like that they are compelled to, to go to on Saturday. This gets passed down from generations. You're going to the same place your grandfather or your great grandfather went to. It's incredible. And that's why it lives on. That's when your team loses, it still matters. The ritual of an American football Saturday, you know, starts with you go year after year. Thousands of fans still looking for tickets, young and old getting pumped up, not worried about the cold. And go Hawks! You tailgate, you become friends with the people you tailgate with. Come on, all you Tigers, and shake your caboose. And shake your caboose. College football fandom has become this broader cultural phenomenon that we use to say, I know who I am, and I'm part of this particular we. I love the fact that alma mater in Latin is nourishing mother. You know, that's the kind of relationship you have with your school, and there's very few vehicles 
in college life that pull that emotion and passion out of you. There's none that do it the way that a college football game does. I love it. I love every minute. There's something more to rooting for your alma mater where you have invested time and energy, whatever it might be, it makes it personal. It kind of stirs that emotion in fans and it, I think at some level it brings back memories, whether it's of your time on campus or a game you watched with your dad or your grandfather or your mom or whatever it might be. You have those personal meanings that are stirred by those images. Oh, I think everything is wonderful. <laughs> the microwave society that we live in, that like we need things quick, you know, we're, we're constantly, we're clicking, we're moving on to the next thing. We are moving forward. We're not, we don't have our head in the sand, but I think college football would lose a lot if you don't hold on and embrace some of those traditions of the past. Ken Burns has said, that right now we have too much pluribus and not enough unum. And he's right, how many things do we do together? What binds us anymore? What do we do together, honestly? And one of the great answers is college football. Because once you cross the threshold at the Big House or the Horseshoe or Beaver Stadium or the Swamp or Death Valley, we no longer care about your race, your gender, your politics, how old you are. We don't actually even care if you went to that school. All we care about is when the song gets to hail, you better know to throw your fist in the air. If you know that, you're one of us, and that's all it takes. When we sing in unison, when we march in formation, when you cheer together with 100,000 of your best friends, you can't get that on TV. You can only get that because your team makes the interception, everyone stands up at once, it's not scripted, no one tells you to do this, and your fight song breaks in 10 seconds later and everybody knows it. How many experiences do we have like that anymore? This is one of the last great bastions of what brought us together. Watson, touchdown! <laughs> to just be dressed, to just be in that crowd coming out the tunnel in front of 80 or 90,000 people, that was a dream. At quarterback from Los Angeles, number seven, Mark Harmon. A dream come true? Sure, certainly. But then you got to play. You know, get the, get the coin toss out of the way. Let's just play. <laughs> That's it, you know? I'd like to state at this time that in my humble opinion, the values derived from competitive sports are too numerous to mention in one television program. I do hope these pigskin pointers have given you a better understanding of the game and will enable you to derive more pleasure from watching future games. This is Frank Leahy saying so long and good luck. <laughs>